if you put loads of detail into a record, then a listener can't hear it all at once. Yeah. And so that kind of turns into, well, it's going to last longer. They're going to get more out of it. Do you remember when you was out playing as a DJ, what kit you was using? Was you, was it, I guess it wasn't vinyl. It was, was at it? the start, yeah. yeah. I started out on vinyl and then moved to CDs and then kind of got into Tractor towards the end. Oh, yeah. Because um, I liked, I was like key matching tracks and then Tractor lets you pitch shift things. Yeah. So kind of, I, me and some friends who were engineers developed our own controller for Tractor, which had like a screen and a, a, some software running in it that would do the maths for the pitching so you could sort of go, oh, this is in A, I want it to be in G sharp. Oh, okay. And it would just kind of tell you when you'd hit it. So it would take into it. account the tempo and the pitch and whatever. Oh, and no but then, yeah, kind of, DJing is still frustrating in a way. I've just found it really frustrating. So is this you why you got out of it? That I suppose this is why I'm asking about the DJing world, is because you've moved on so much from there. What, what was it? Even though you've got millions of tracks in your laptop or on your USB keys, Yeah. DJing kind of falls into ruts very easily and kind of, you know, you can only find so much new music that you like. So to be free of that yeah. and, yeah, and just having, it's the opposite with, with when you're playing with other musicians on stage, every little thing creates new paths that you can go off on, like new, so it becomes really surprising, yeah. like fresh process. Every gig's different and the way the crowd is, is different. It kind of, you feed off that. So in this, you've got these these drums, and they kind of sound real, but not real, and they're a bit erratic, and almost every hit is a different velocity. Everything's changing all the time. Again. Yeah, those drums are actually samples off, like off a jazz record. I took a, <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> took loads of, you know, chopped up a, a whole break section out of a jazz record, and kind of, it's a mix of sort of meticulous edits and like I had like a humanizing plugin that I'd made by that point, yeah. which sort of messes with the timing. I'd found this guy's research that showed how people make timing errors. Oh yes. And he'd measured people playing together. And if say you and I are just kind of tapping out a beat together, trying to play in unison, if I'm slightly late on that first beat, you'll hear it and think, oh, well I'd best slow down then. Yeah. But you're also gonna make a mistake on your next one yeah. and I'm gonna make a mistake on yeah. my next one. And I've also listened to your first beat and responded to that as well. Yeah. Feedback is the main part of making chaos. Is how, and out of that comes unpredictable, rich, detailed, nuanced stuff. But also what his science kind of showed was that out of this kind of feedback and the specific kinds of errors, you can actually hear that. Like the, an audience listening can tell like either this is two musicians playing together or this is two unrelated recordings put next to one another or this is a robot or this yeah, yeah. and or this is bad jitter on your midi timing or whatever yeah. and you can you find it pleasant when you hear human timing and you find it unpleasant to hear just white noise random random errors yeah. so the sort of built-in humanizer in you know the random humanizer in in Ableton or in Cubase yeah. is actually is wrong that there's something that you can't fake about having two people play together. The latest record, The Animal Spirits, was, was made planning to play it live. That was the whole idea of it. Like, so I built a setup that could do some things that I thought were interesting and then tried to write songs just for that setup, knowing that I can then, you know, then I can use that and take it out on the road. So it, was, yeah. it wasn't exactly this case, but it was similar. So this is like the division of labor between the the modular just contains what I thought was essential for making a, a beefy, fat, rich, texturally interesting kind of sound on stage. And I delegated as much jobs as possible to the computer because the computer can obviously load something that's the same as it was last time you're on stage and stuff like that. The, this is two oscillators that sound great and a, a sort of VCA mixer and they connect to this wasp filter and that makes a sort of bass a duophonic bass 
synth voice which yeah like these oscillators do sound better than plugins normally in the studio it's all about repatching and you know trying out different combinations and whatever for an audience it would be rubbish to watch me spend five minutes pulling wires out and trying just, to get it just set give up me a minute and, yeah, i'm just going to change this yeah. it just wouldn't work what i've done is i've i've got it in a fixed configuration but the computer it, a lot of it goes in and out of the computer so that the computer can act as like a, a matrix for for repatching it so this is like a matrix that connects everything in the modular to everything in the computer I have like polysynths, mellotrons, uh, delay lines, reverb, chorus, a looper, a drum synth, a couple of compressors. These down the down the right hand side are envelopes, and then like LFOs. So it's got this. There's that main riff. The top two of those sequences are playing that riff. The idea of it was that those kind of based off ideas in a lot of African music of like rotating the pattern. So when it gets, when these kind of bars, it's like building up the urge to change. And then when it gets to the top, you can hear it switch one of the patterns round, like rotates it round into a different phase. And then all these kind of, you'll see it saying stuff like trill or whatever. That's as the bar gets to the top, it decides oh, I'm going to do a swap two notes there. Or, you know, as this bar up here gets to the top, it's going to do a little trill. I mean, the, the melody itself is only a few notes in there, but because they're moving around, it's, it feels like it's constantly changing. It sounds very, very complex. But yeah, it's but it's also quite basic. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Of, finding richness in something that's very simple yeah, is absolutely. yeah that's kind of my idea um so then when it hits the modular and it's playing these oscillators you can introduce new um partials or harmonics. yeah so these these kind of bring in new and then these ideas about having it flexible so that you can change it would make you have a better a more enjoyable life or a, a better a show that people felt more connected to yeah. i think that's yeah. the yeah even if you're playing really quantized stuff where you want to play the hits if you have the ability to stretch it out to change the arrangement in real time yeah. you're going to be able to connect with the audience so i may just to show this off really this is like a, a copper strong string synthesizer and that that spring is attached to a contact mic that's feeding into the, as you know, feeding into the system. And that's uh, some parameters changing. And it's kind of just as an example of richness coming out of feedback, this, this is just delay lines basically, right. but cross modulating each other, kind of pitch. Yeah, like a sitar has a curved bridge, so as the string goes up, it makes itself. Sorry, as the string goes down where it hits the bridge, it makes itself shorter. Yeah. So that's like it FMs itself. Ah, right, yeah. So then that's a lot of the sort of richness of it. Comes but from that kind sounds of sounds so rich and harmonically rich and <laughs> awesome. Can we just thank James for coming down today? What a great session! Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks, mate. Nice one.